Does the bucket approach destroy wealth? An interesting one. The answer is yes, and I'll share with you why and why I, I, I'm not that concerned with it. But, uh, oh man, who sent me this email? I forgot, but a guy sent this to me from Larry Swedro, and I'm a big fan of Larry uh, through advisor perspectives. Just uh, love those guys. And uh, just so much, so much wonderful, wonderful stuff in there. I don't agree with a lot of it. Eh, I'll say a lot. I don't agree with all of it. Let's put it that way. I do agree with a lot. I, I want to say that some of the writers they have in there are just nuts, but Larry takes to task the bucket strategy, the strategy I like a bunch of people in financial planning like as well. And um, we'll share with you why I think it's of interest and uh, you need to recognize that there are uh, some deficiencies in the bucket strategy, which I would never uh, disclaim. But uh, anyway, let's dive into this. I think you like it. Note my new t-shirt I just got. The Gwinnett, we just got back from the Gwinnett Stripers baseball game, AAA baseball in uh, in uh, north of, well, actually in Gwinnett County, not North Fulton County. I love minor league baseball, man. So when I retire, I need a double-A, maybe a triple-A team where I can buy uh, season tickets. Uh, I, there's nothing better than minor league baseball, just fun. All right, so let's dive into this. All right, so uh, let's see here. Let me get myself small. There we go. All right, so this is dated well, 1-7-2019. Wow, I missed this one. Okay, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, Larry Swedro, the bucket approach, does a bucket approach destroy wealth? And this is a long article, and we're going to miss some of the research. That we're not going to talk about some of the research that uh, he, he dives into because it's, it's frankly kind of boring. Uh, but I want to talk. We'll read the initial, then we'll skip halfway through, and then go towards the latter part of it. The bucket approach to retirement planning has been routinely adopted by financial planners ever since it was popularized by uh, Harold Ivensky. I'm not sure that's true, actually. Uh, right here. I got this book right here. Uh, this guy, actually, he's one of my heroes just because he took the SEC to task, the Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, they ruled against him with their independent judges. I forgot what they're called. And... Uh, essentially ruined his life. And uh, if you read Ben Stein, Ben Stein has some articles. And uh, my man Sergio had, had reminded me about Lucia. And, I, and I have, I've had his book for a long time. And uh, I actually enjoy it a lot because um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Now, I have no clue how much he charges for his uh, – this was written uh, just in 2010. But uh, anyway, I have no – so I guess Havinsky, Harold Havinsky uh, has certainly uh, – was beat uh, uh, Lucia to the punch, but I think he's been using it since the late nineties, the bucket approach. So who knows? I got no clue how much this guy charged. I don't know if he paid Ben Stein a fee for fine. I don't I have no clue. I have no clue. I don't want to speak on that. Uh, but the fact was he was completely uh, fined, run out of the business by a, just an overbearing SEC. And this is why I cannot stand the regulatory industry because it's freaking nuts, man. They're not there to protect mom and pop. I don't know what they're trying to protect. I guess their own jobs, the only thing I can think. And these independent law judges, uh, he took a Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in his favor, not against the case specifically, but about that you can't have independent law judges who are hired by the SEC uh, to make law, essentially. You couldn't do that. And so uh, I, I love it. And, uh, and I, <laughs> you can tell who, how good of a case it was by the people who were against uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court. I think it was a 7-2 decision. But anyway. So I've been reading, so I've been a big fan of, of the uh, bucket strategy for a long time, and I can't remember how I came across it. Maybe just intuition. I don't know. Uh, client, so here's the bucket strategy. Clients keep several years of assets in safe, liquid investments while investing the rest of their portfolio more aggressively. But new research shows that this approach actually destroys a portion of a client's wealth. The research comes from uh, Javier Estrada, a professor of financial management at uh, some school in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, before we go into our Estrada's research, let's review how the success uh, and failure of a financial plan uh, is measured using Monte Carlo situations. Um, I, I don't want to do that just because it bores me. Uh, but again, essentially what we're going to talk about, the answer generally is expressed in terms of safe withdrawal rate. Uh, the percentage of the portfolio you can withdraw in the first year with a retire with future annual withdrawals adjusted to inflation. Uh, with his, while historical returns can provide insight, it's critical is that investors not simply project the past into the future. I, I completely agree. Current valuation metrics should be used instead, which is when you go to bonds, you, you just you cannot use anything. Then I mean, you can look. You can what's a ten-year treasury right now? Ten-year treasury two point oh, I think uh, two point oh five. 
2.048. You can't use anything above that if you're having government bonds, unless you're going to go 30 years, and those probably about two and a quarter or two and a half, uh, and corporate bonds three. You cannot use historical returns for bonds. You can't. Whether or not you can use historic returns for stocks, I don't. I use seven and a half percent on stocks and sixteen percent standard deviation. I think it's absolutely spot on. I'll, I'll go to my grave saying that's absolutely adequate. You can't use twelve percent. You can't. I mean, you could. I just I I don't get it. And if someone says you should only use four percent, I I don't agree with that either. So I completely think seven and a half percent on stocks, three to three and a half percent on bonds is absolutely adequate. But you also got to have the standard deviation there. I went over that last night. I won't get too much into it again here today. I mean, I'll do a video solely on that here in the future. All right, so uh, another problem that must be considered that investment returns are not constant and sub systemic withdrawals during bear markets cause portfolio values to fall to levels from which they may never recover. That's the sequence of return risk. Over the 26-year period from 1973 to 1999, the S&P 500 index provided a nominal return of 13.9% but a real return of 8.2. With hindsight, you might think that given the 8.2% real return, it would have been safe to withdraw 7% a year. Unfortunately, had you retired at the end of 1972 and followed that strategy, you would have run out of money uh, within 10 years. And this is one of my pet peeves about Dave Ramsey's because he's, he's got to know this stuff. He's got to know this stuff. And then he had a video on someone had a million bucks, what they could take out from their portfolio and what he was saying. I just, I was, I was for it. I was for it. Uh, this was because the sequence of return risk, avarice returns on the early stages of retirement are particularly harmful. Uh, the S&P 500 lost about 40% in the 73 and 74 bear market. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and he talks about the negatives of the uh, shortcomings of Monte Carlo, which we're not going to talk about here. Uh, the Javier Estrada does cover 21 countries over the 115 year period from 1900 through 2014. Um, and I do like that because just because the U.S. did one thing doesn't mean we can presume the U.S. will do that going forward, especially since the U.S. was essentially an emerging market in the early 19th, in the early 20th century. All right. Uh, so let's, let's talk about uh, he talks about some of his other uh, agenda. Not what's the word I'm looking for? A thought process instead of using safe withdrawal rates, some other ways you could look at uh, uh, portfolio success uh, variability and whatnot. And I've just died. It bores me. So I'm not going to talk about that. All right. So then Larry talks about the bucket approach. The bucket approach was developed to deal with the problem of mental accounting. And I talk about mental accounting in my book. I've done a number of uh, studies on it or, or videos on the, uh, the, the, the issue behind the behavioral economics of mental accounting. Richard Thayer won a Nobel Prize in economics because of that research. Uh, his thing on mental accounting was very interesting. And again, I cite this in my book that uh, you're always more prone uh, to be comfortable taking income from uh, taking money from income to spend when your money is coming from income, work, dividends. But you're less uh, likely to spend when it's coming from principal, uh, simply because you, you see it going down. It scares the hell out of you. So it's, it's interesting. Mental accounting in terms of the bucket approach, we'll talk about, it, which is the tendency to categorize, categorize categorize and evaluate economic outcomes by grouping assets into a number of non-interchangeable mental accounts. This approach, which has many variation, essentially uh, variations, essentially calls for parking safely in cash or short-term high-quality bonds, a few years of withdrawals, and then investing the rest of the portfolio more aggressively. If the aggressive portion of the portfolio suffers a sharp loss, the retiree can withdraw from the cash reserve to avoid liquidating assets at a depressed valuation. By avoiding selling funds from a portfolio that has just suffered a sharp loss, the bucket approaches addresses the need for safe near-term liquidity and the goal of long-term growth of wealth. Uh, in his own practice, Harold uh, Evensky uses a two-bucket approach that he can effectively implement and monitor. He maintains a cash reserve for clients that's sufficient to handle liquidity needs over a five-year period and invest the remainders of client assets with a longer-term horizon. Um, uh, and Estrada noted the, the, the appeal for several reasons. There's no need to worry about the sequence of return risks. It is comforting, enabling a retiree to stop worrying about the possibility of having to liquidate assets at the wrong time. Uh, it is consistent with well-known behavioral bias of mental accounting. A retiree is likely to find the separation between the draw account and the investment account appealing. I 100% agree with that. And it's easy to implement. While the bucket approach may have psychological benefits, which may justify its use, that doesn't mean it's optimal. It provides the highest likelihood of success. I just want to point this out. It doesn't mean it's optimal, and, and optimal means provide the highest likelihood of success. And this is where I just, I got to veer off here. 
anyone who thinks the, the bucket approach is the is the max uh, utility of your portfolio is 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 foolish. No one would ever argue that this is the max utility of a portfolio, and the reason for that is because you're always going to have cash and under um, a, a portion of your portfolio in an underperforming asset class, i.e., cash. I mean, it's like inherent. I just I'm surprised that Larry. It's, it's weird to me. I was like, yeah, no one ever would ever say the bucket approach is your most efficient use of your retirement money when you're keeping 15, 20 percent in cash. I mean, it's just I, I was. <laughs> but does it pro provide the highest likelihood of success? Well, it depends on what success means. Does success means not losing sleep at night and maybe leave it a little bit less to your heirs? Uh, that's pretty doggone successful, even if the portfolio isn't as efficient as what it could be, and have the highest utility. I, I'm, I just, I'm, I, I don't know what's a, I don't know what the word is. I just, I was, I was like, I was like, huh? No one would say that. I mean, yeah. but I will. The funny thing is, I'll tell you. If we look at the the highest rate of success from two thousand October two thousand seven to March 9th of 2009, the bucket approach was best. Why? Because at 20% of cash, <laughs> whereas the the most efficient didn't. It, it, I, I mean, it depends on what that time frame is. <laughs> that was just weird to me. I'm saying uh, while the bucket approach may have psychological benefits, which may justify its use, that doesn't mean it's optimal. Psychological, psychological benefits are optimal. <laughs> Hey, uh, to explore this issue, Estrada examined how bucket strategies perform relative to static strategies, i.e. a typical 60-40 portfolio is rebalanced annually. I, I mean, I, I just, I hate to say I'm, I, oh, I guarantee the static strategy is going to do better over many years of time. I guarantee it because you're having more risk assets. That's not, uh, his database covered 21 countries over a 115 year period between 1900 and 2014, as well as st 11 static tra uh, strategies uh, with fixed allocations of stocks and treasuries. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, the bucket, uh, okay, the three, uh, okay, let's see, I just, I don't care. Um, let's see. Estrada's analysis was based, analysis was based on a thousand dollar portfolio at the beginning of retirement, a 4% initial withdrawal weight with subs subsequent annual withdrawals adjusted for inflation. Oh, yeah. Made at the beginning of each year in a 30 year retirement period. The annual withdrawals were taken proportionally from stocks and bonds and stocks and treasury bills with static strategies and from one of the two buckets. Uh, okay, so basically what he finds is that his method would have, uh, well, he says it. Estrato found that the bucket approach underperforms static strategies based on all four ways of ass assessing performance the failure rate, the number of shortfall years, and his two uh, measurements that he's uh, collected here. Uh, the, he explained the poor performance of the bucket approach. Eh, I challenge the idea is poor. Uh, poor to who? Someone maximizing efficiency. That's not a retiree. A retiree is not trying to maximize efficiency. Most implementations of the bucket approach and clearly the most popular versions that involve parking in bills, a fixed number of annual draws, distribute funds more from aggressive buckets into more conservative buckets, but not the other way around. Put differently, although bucket strategies avoid selling low by withdrawing from bucket one after stocks perform badly, they do not take advantage of also buying low as strategic uh, stat strategies do through rebalancing. Strat static strategies, uh, this guy observed, sell assets that have become relatively more expensive and buy assets that become relatively cheaper. All right, I, I literally don't disagree with that in the least. But here's a kicker, and I kind of chuckled. The results led Estrada to conclude, however plausible, com comforting, consisting with mental accounting, and easy to implement, the bucket strategy may be simple static strategies, which call for periodic rebalancing and are just as easy to implement. Would work would make would make retirees better off. All right. Um, I, uh, I challenge that quite a bit, actually. Uh, for those still clinging the bucket approach, Estrada also found that the bucket rule one, the simplest and perhaps most popular rule, rule was outperformed by bucket strategies that take a longer longer perspective of stock market performance. Yeah, I, well, so if I see the whole point about this. If we're looking at 60-40 portfolio, right, and we're saying, well, that's not the max optimization. Why? Because you should have 100% stocks. And if you, uh, if you, if you and just hope that you don't retire in 1973, that's what you should do because that's how you optimize your portfolio. Well, you can't do that, Josh. That's not fair. Well, that's the whole, that's the point of the bucket strategy. We don't know what you're retiring into, but we do know there is this thing called mental accounting and mental accounting simply consists of the idea 
of when a 60-40 portfolio gets crushed like it did. I mean, Wellington was still down 22.8% in 2008. All right, so let's not pretend that, in fact, let's take it. Let me, hold on just a second. I want to look at something here. Hold on. Look at what Wellington did uh, from October 2007 to March of 2009. Uh, adjusted close right here, my friends, is adjusted for dividends. So we're adding dividends back in the portfolio. I wonder if I can get rid of these people here. Yeah, sweet. Oh, I can't. I thought it was on X there. I guess I don't. All right. So anyway, what we see here is when he adjusted close. So it started 1874 at the October 1st, 2007. It ended. This is actually just at the beginning of March. So it's not even March 9th, 2009. It ended 1316. And actually, let's just do something. I want to see if we can do. Bear me just one second. We're going to go to 0301-2009. And we're going to hit done. And then we're going to hit apply. All right, done. And then let's hit apply here. And we're going to hit daily or hit apply here. So we started out at 1874 uh, and it ended up at 1199 adjusted. So 18.74 minus 11.99. Uh, it was down 6.75, uh, $6.75 divided by 18.74. So Wellington was down 36%. 36% Wellington was down. Uh, from October 2007 to March 9th of 2009. Why is mental accounting inefficient? Well, because that money wasn't being rebalanced into the market, uh, so theoretically, uh, but the facts were how many people, retirees, who we already know that mental accounting is a big deal when it comes to principal versus income, are just are, are sitting tight while Wellington is down 36%. I, I'm just, I, I don't, I, yes, yes, 60, 40 portfolio, which is essentially what the Wellington is, would absolutely optimize you having money in CDs. And this is why I don't like bonds, by the way, because bonds did not give you the reprieve that I think a lot of people do. Uh, only government bonds. So that's it. Government bonds and certificates. So if you only get 2% on a 10-year government bond, you can get 2.5% on a FDIC insured CD where you only lock up your money for three or four years. The CD is the way to go right now without question. It's not even debatable. But corporate bonds got hammered. Government bonds did not. Ginny May did not. And CDs did not. The only thing that made money was government bonds not, and CDs. Nothing else did. So the mental accounting, the idea that it's suboptimal uh, when Wellington was down 36%. I'm just telling you right now, man. I, I, your old buddy Josh went to bonds. Not much because I didn't have that much and I was still working. But I went to bonds because I was worried about my job. And I said, if my job goes kaput, and this is all I got. I'm throwing good money after bad, and the market doesn't recuperate. I got nothing. I have nothing. And uh, and think about it like that. That's mental accounting for me. Thinking I got bonds, I got I got investments. I might lose my job. I have no income. The only income I have from my portfolio, my portfolio gets taken, gets killed. I can't have that happen. Thus, I'm going to freaking bonds. Uh, and just if you're a retiree, you're like I, I can't lose this money. I'm going to bonds. It's just uh, yeah. That's why the whole thing about the mental accounting I think is getting overlooked significantly here. And I wish they would not. Um, I get it. It's not it's not optimal. I get it. But real life people in real world scenarios like uh, October through 2007 to March 9th of 2009 happen. And how many people have the intestinal fortitude to hang in there? I, I just I frankly don't think that many. I just don't. Um, and I, you know, look, I seen it. And now, what? Now, let me just go. This is the uh, comments on this, and I it's just uh, advisor perspectives is just great because so many. I'm just, yeah. I mean, so many. I'm. I like this guy, Jr. Actually. Um. Anyway, I, I don't want to discount this guy. Just we had some uh, issues on uh, whole life insurance and stuff. I just I found it a little bit. Uh, Dirk is a well-known guy in the industry. Um, he challenged me on the retirement. I was surprised actually because he challenged me on my. There is no retirement crisis, and uh, his 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 argument I found was was uh, was uh, weak on Social Security. He was basically saying uh, Social Security is not a an income that people can live on, and I I just completely disagree with that. Um, of course, Larry. Now, but look, Dirk is a well known guy in the industry. He doesn't know me other than this. I mean, he would never say, "Do you know that guy, Josh Scanlon?" But like, who the hell is that? I mean, he doesn't know me. But you know, I've been following the guy. I like the guy. I just I, I find some of these guys have been in the business so long. They're so convinced. Because uh, they work with a certain select group of people of affluent clients that they forget what I think a lot of these guys, what the average persons are dealing with in the United States. And the average person is not living off 150000 It's just not impossible for that to happen when the median household income is only 60000 uh, Tim, I've, I've, he's, I've read him many times. 
uh, Ron Sirs is even here. Uh, here's Harold at Vince Game. This is like the uh, the Mount Rushmore of financial planning gurus. It's, it's nuts in my opinion. And they have different opinions. Uh, Vinsky challenges the idea of mental accounting um, about that you need. We're dealing with real human beings. I found that just to be incredible. And uh, Estrada uh, emailed back to Harold. I just, it's great. Um, yeah, let's see. Who else? Went? My man Joe Tomlinson. Love Joe Tomlinson. I thought that guy's just freaking nuts. Uh, I think he, he used to live in Maine, Greenville, Maine, wherever the hell that is. And, uh, but I think he lives in England now, UK or something like that, which is too bad because I just like the fact he was from Maine. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, anyway, he wrote this article, do annuities re reduce bequest value. Just so much stuff in here. Not sure who that is. Not sure who that is. Um, uh, don't know this guy, but I thought it was uh, interesting. I want to share with you one thing. Yeah, I'm a big fan, Jr. Right, this guy right here. I, I found that I don't know who Burt Livingston is, but I found this interesting. Uh, so many attempt to mathematize or mathematize real life issues. The timing, behavioral status of both the client and the advisor, combined with the age and health issues of both of the client and advisor, make this a very difficult subject. Actually, one of the things that uh, it was in here someplace. Some who was it saying they're trying to make it more sciencey, and I thought that was. Uh, was that guy who was that it was interesting in here i thought it was this guy actually uh he was trying to say something about it was trying to make it more sciencey and uh, i just i hate it because <laughs> there is no science in this stuff you can't have science you, i mean gravity it either falls to the ground or it doesn't that's science there is no we have no clue what the future holds for investing because it's all human based. There is no science to investing. There is none as human beings, human beings and advocating socialism, human beings advocating capitalism have two different results. Gravity will be gravity. That is science. Investment returns are on human beings. It's not science. It's, I just, I don't get this need for us. Yeah, right here, they're, they're this guy. I think the ongoing effort to bring more sophisticated science, math, and statistics to our professional work is wor very worthwhile, uh, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we are dealing with human decision makers that don't always respond in perfectly rational ways. I that's I completely, unequivocally agree with my man, Tim. Again, none of these guys will be. I mean, look, I'm sitting in my freaking t-shirt, my Gwinnett Stripers t-shirt. Uh, they don't know. But uh, that's fine. I don't care. I just know that I like what they write. I'm a big fan of advisor perspectives. I like hearing the uh, uh, the different points of view. But I hate the idea of science. Uh, there was stats, the statistics that would show like a, a, it's a traditional bell curve. But I showed that yesterday. I'm not going to do that. All way, already way off the gravy train here with this craziest thing. But um, there is no science in this. It will never be. There's no evidence-based investing. It's silly. It's silly. It's silly. Don't fall for that stuff. It's just nuts. The reason the bucket approach works is because mental accounting dwarfs all scientific approaches, all modern portfolio theory, all efficient market hypothesis. It dwarfs, uh, what's the other one I used to can't stand? It's, uh, um, I'm drawing, there's a four letter acronym, uh, which, <laughs> Jeez, little weed. The Black Shoals option. Man, I can't believe it's not, it's not C A G R. Ah! I can't believe uh, I'm drawing a blank what it was about your how stocks will perform based on a four letter acronym. I'm drawing a blank. And if you know what it is, put it in the show notes. Anyway, there's no science in, in how you act. That's not science. That's human. That's psychological. Psycho psychology, I guess. Sociology, I don't know, whatever the freaking thing is, psychology, I guess. Um, and it's your human chemistry is going to be different than that guy's human chemistry and that big old noggin of his. You can't make a science decision on how you react relative to a 36% decline in Wellesley or Wellington. You can't because you're going to react differently than me. And so because we have react differently, there's inherently not science. It's all emotional driven. Thus, the bucket approach. Look, I'm not here to defend the bucket approach. I just know I've been around this business for a long time and I know how people react. Seeing the Wellington fund down 36% and me as your financial advisor, so no, we have the most efficient portfolio to optimize your success. You're going to be like, dude, get the hell out of here. I'm just telling you, I've seen it. I felt it. I've been there. <sighs> All right, smash. And look, I'm not here to disparage Larry and the guy Javier Estrada. I love this stuff. I just find it. I just challenge the whole assumption about the bucket approach destroying wealth. 
It destroys wealth if you do everything like a robot. Yes, it does, but it doesn't destroy wealth for most people who aren't going to uh, stay in there like a robot, who just, man, yeah, all right, I'm here, light cigars, $100 bills, I'm cool. No one's going to do that. No one's going to do that. Don't forget to smash, share, like, and we'll see, and uh, comment. We'll see you next time.